This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, the voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Jamie Scott Ukataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable. These virtual roundtables lead us up to our on site CEO roundtable at our executive networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Next one up, November 6th through the 7th in downtown Los Angeles. More info at thetelecomexchange.com. Today's roundtable is brought to you by our video collaboration managed services provider, Pinnica. With your video platform, our panelists and moderator are able to stream in live video feeds across the world. So thank you, Pinnica. And thank you to our viewers who are joining us live and to those who are joining us on demand. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's topic, the state of the subsea cables. Helping us to break this down, I'm honored to introduce our guest moderator and my friend, Mr. Eric Gutschall. He is the founder and CEO of United Cable Company, or UCC. He was also instrumental, of course, with the development and deployment of Hibernia Express, while he was one of the founding fathers of Hibernia Atlantic, that Irish company formed in Summit, New Jersey back in 2004. And before then, you probably remember him uh, when he was part of management at Tyco Submarine Systems, and then back in the early 90s, MCI on Wall Street. So phenomenal, long-term expert in the subsea space, my friend and yours, Mr. Eric Gutschel. Eric, thanks for being here. The floor is yours, my friend. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, kudos to uh, JSNA, uh, one of our very first customers at uh, Hibernia. And I uh, well, got to say, it's you're the, uh, the leading edge when it comes to PR uh, in our industry, for sure. So thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining me. I've got three uh, longtime friends. Gosh, I've known these three guys, some of them better part of 20 years. Sat cubes away from one guy named Gil Santelis and and I, my good friend up in Toronto, Mike, and out in Vancouver, Ken, who I've also known for the better part of 20 years. So I'm going to kick it off uh, with just introducing our panel, uh, talking about everyone, and then we're going to have a few questions for some folks on the state of the subsea. But I'd like to introduce uh, the gentlemen and have them go around and briefly talk about their latest projects. So Mike Cunningham, CEO, Chief Executive Officer of Cross Lake Fiber. We have Gil Santley's founder and CEO of New Jersey Fiber Exchange, NJFX, and Ken Thorpe, chairman and founder of Cascadia Gateway Corporation out in Vancouver. So why don't we start, uh, guys, we're going to briefly go down the line. Let us know your latest subsea uh, project or data center build that you're part of and um, how that will further drive connectivity onto network operators that, that you would uh, service. So, Mike, uh, if we could, uh, please kick it off, and then we'll go to Gil, and then Ken. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Thank our most recent project is Cross Lake Fiber, which is developing a new cable from Toronto, Canada, down to, to Buffalo, New York. And we're really excited about this project, uh, especially you know, personally for myself, because it's in my backyard, and it's the first time I've been able to do a project that's that's really uh, relevant to me uh, as a user. And we're really excited about the project because it brings, for the first time, real dark fiber connectivity on a long haul basis into Canada. Uh, the concept has been around for, I think, the better part of a decade to build through the lake. And I think finally, uh, we're, we're well positioned given our background in, in the subsea space to actually make that happen. What's exciting, I think, about the, the cable itself is that we are uh, we're really offering dark fiber, which is the first time you can really get dark fiber. It's a physically diverse route from the existing uh, cable routes that currently connect Toronto uh, down to Buffalo. And it's a lower latency route to get from, from Toronto down to Buffalo. And as well as it's a lower, uh, it's a shorter distance uh, between Toronto and New York City, New Jersey regions, uh, allowing for lower latency connectivity between those two markets as well. That's great. Thank you very much, Mike. And I guess, you know, with, uh, you know, I, I just got to ask, what's the, what is the age of that fiber that uh, everyone else has laid terrestrially? 
Uh, the age is, I think, almost 20 years. I think 18, 19 years is the age of the current long haul fibers or cable that uh, that goes between Toronto and, and Buffalo. So there's definitely, uh, I think, the uh, the ability to to improve the route with with new fiber and new glass, and I think that uh, that just helps performance, especially that it's it's new. Uh, there's not a lot of splice points along the way, given that it's going through the lake. And it's really designed truly for a, a long haul route. Well, I mean, not, not only long haul, I mean, it, you've got two kind of two benefits I see. You're also cutting off half a millisecond from the terrestrial known routes, right? And then you're looking at nearly 100% buried route, which is very uncommon in the Northeast. Um, so I think you've got a, a late, low latency play by half a millisecond for the people that want to trade. And I think you also have a diversity play. I, I, absolutely. I mean, the, the latency play definitely, uh, or the latency improvement, I think definitely is a driver for certain customers that have latency sensitive traffic, whether it's transactional or financial institutions. And at the same time, you're right. We've developed this really using some of the, um, you know, the engineering is, is using some of the best practices that you'd see on your transoceanic cables. And we followed that through to the, the terrestrial builds on the ends as well. So that the entire route is an underground route and a very high, uh, high resiliency route, I'd say. That's great. I commend you on such a project. Uh, I look forward to seeing how that grows in the future, but I think you've got a, you've got a winner there for sure. Thanks, Mike. Gil, tell us a little bit about NJFX since our days at MCI and, and your days at Four Connections. And now you're on to the data center side. Talk to us. Sure. So if we think back in the day when we were selling long distance in 1990, we've come quite a way. Um, since those days, I started a company in 2001 called Four Connections. And Four Connections was responsible for building lots of infrastructure across New Jersey. Uh, we got to important places like the New York Stock Exchange, uh, the NASDAQ data center facility and trading platforms, uh, New York City river crossings, down all the way across data centers that mattered across New Jersey. But the one area that we could never get into back in the day was the Tyco landing station. Uh, traditionally, cable landing station said not for others to come in. It was really meant to take a cable across the ocean, land it, and take a single cable to backhaul to a major metro. In our case, in New Jersey, and for Long Island, that became New York City. It made total sense back in 1980, 1990 maybe even, but with today's needs for diversity, there needs to be ways to access these cables and have direct access to either the 8 million square feet of data center space we have in New Jersey, have express routes down to Ashburn, Virginia, or just provide multiple ways to get back to New York so you don't have the issue of losing your diversity or losing your international connectivity. What's also changed is it's no longer these 20-year-old consortium cables. We've got brand new systems that are being built and being deployed. CBRAS arrived here on our campus four months ago. Uh, Telecom Italia, uh, Tata, all have capacity on the CBRAS uh, cable. That cable is the fastest nonstop cable going down to Brazil. Second to that cable is the cable landing in Virginia Beach. That one's called Brusa. That one's gonna be on shore in the next six to eight months. We hope to have them here also and provide additional ways for you to get across the Atlantic Ocean. Most recently, Aquacoms arrived at NJFX. And what that did is provided customers at NJFX a third way to get to Europe. So what we've really done is created a carrier neutral cable landing station where we were in the meeting room inside Tata's cable landing station, but also have a separate tier three facility that now you can go ahead and start having your equipment at interconnection points as well, whether it's caching applications, whether it's low latency applications, we're agnostic, we're space power and cooling. We try to make sure that all our customers are educated on all the routes that exist. So think of it this way, you sit down with our VP of sales, Doug Corbett, he's gonna walk you through stick diagrams that show you 20 different ways to get across towards Canada, towards down towards Miami, down towards uh, Virginia Beach, and make sure that the customers can market their assets appropriately. Our job is to provide information. Our job is to allow others to be able to put additional cable landing stations on this property. So back to the beginning, one building, cable landing station. Day two, NJFX arrives, 
brand new tier three facility. We're sitting in it today. We're in the lobby today of our conference room. And then now we're going to have 58 acres to work with business continuity, additional data centers, or more cable landing stations. It's really what should have been done in the beginning, and we're going to give Ashburn a run for their money. It is a, a fantastic idea, Joe. I'm, I'm flattered by the uh, person that maybe has given you an idea about that a long, long, long time ago, Tata, uh, Tyco, uh, Tyco Submarine Systems. But uh, fan, phenomenal uh, campus. And the size of your campus, size of the current data centers, how big? So the current facility is 64,000 square feet. It's a nine megawatt design, high density, low density. We can accommodate customers with various types of requirements. You can take on another Sandy or two, I think. So one of the things that people always ask, and as you know, the Tyco landing station. So you're so close to the ocean, what does that mean to you? So when Tyco, and you were part of Tyco back then, when they chose this location, we sit at one of the highest points in New Jersey naturally, 64 feet above sea level. You think of in terms of other important buildings, the White House in the United States is at 43 feet above sea level. Midtown Manhattan's at 34 feet above sea level. We're basically at a mountaintop with this facility in terms of having any issue with water, the ocean. We're Hurricane 5 resistant. We're ready for the big one. And even during I, Sandy, there was never an issue here. I just wish our beach houses uh, down the shore fared a little better. <laughs> I, know we both took, I, I know we both took a beating on that. But thank you, Gil. And lastly, my good friend Ken Thorpe from the West Coast, Vancouver, a gentleman I've known for a better part of 20 years. Uh, I think I had hair then, too, Ken. But, uh, why don't you take us through your latest project? I should say projects that kind of connect a little bit like Gil and a lot like Mike with Fiber and uh, Green Data Center. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eric. And Eric, thanks again for, for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Thanks you. Thanks to you as well, Jamie. Uh, yeah, what started out as really a very simple build uh, between Vancouver and Seattle uh, has literally uh, morphed into now a cable landing station in Vancouver. Thanks, Eric. That's all your fault. And uh, and uh, a data center, 100,000 square foot data center, 20 megawatts of power just north of the border. There is no data center close to where that is. South of, uh, uh, south of Vancouver, there is not another data center of any, of any size at all. So from a, a landing station perspective, we've been uh, talking to, we're now right at signing now with the Vancouver Port Authority uh, to actually put uh, a cable landing station right in the port. That'll be the first time in history that that's ever happened. Uh, the provincial government here uh, are extremely interested in that. What they would like to see happen is for us to uh, lay a festooned uh, fiber optic cable uh, up, the, uh, up the west coast into Prince Rupert, which is the other deep water port here. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of impetus behind getting this, uh, getting this landing station done. And at the end of the day, it'll be the only landing station on the west coast of North America that is not in a tsunami zone. That's fantastic. I've got to, I've got to ask another question similar to what I've asked Mike. What is the age of uh, that fiber? When's the last time there was a fiber build on the, uh, in that quarter? I mean, heck, Microsoft, all they do is talk about the, uh, the Vancouver to Seattle corridor. When's the last time new glass has been laid? 23 years ago. Wow. Same, uh, same, same kind of bucket that Mike's in. 23 years, 24 years. Eh? So it's, uh, well, I, I think it's a, a very valuable project. Clearly, uh, the demand is there. Uh, and you've got a lot of over the tops that kind of sit on the West Coast between the Bay and Seattle and Vancouver. And a lot of jobs are moving up to Vancouver. So I think that, uh, at least from Microsoft, Microsoft's perspective, it's a very, uh, very good project, Ken. Thank you. So uh, it takes me into the question, uh, uh, the second question outside of introductions. I just wanted to know how bandwidth demand and the need for dark fiber played a role for your business models, and what verticals are you seeing the need for this type of capacity? Where are you seeing the demand come from? And I'll start off with uh, Mike again. Yeah, I think that, uh, at least in our instance, dark fiber is the, the bread and butter of, of our business. I mean, we're a high fiber count cable that will be selling dark fiber to everyone and anyone on, on the route. So that's really the, the rationale for our build. And I think that we're seeing uh, 
the demand for, for dark fiber as opposed to lit capacity from numerous segments of the market. Uh, your OTTs definitely want, uh, want dark fiber and want to, to light it themselves. And increasingly carriers uh, are, are, are wanting dark fiber as opposed to lit capacity. I think that's, that's definitely something that they would like and the economics don't necessarily make sense. I think on our route, we've designed uh, it from a commercial perspective to, to really equate to a very um, uh, low equivalent of lit capacity where you go over that inflection point where it makes sense to get dark fiber. And as well, I think we see it from uh, the, the financial services industry where the, the ability to, to control that route and, and have an increased level of security on it as financial institutions start to build out their own fiber routes uh, really much more broadly than they have in the past. I think those are the different drivers in our instance uh, for, for dark fiber. And I, I, and I would think, uh, you know, given that corridor again, I, you're leasing 100 gigs, you know, anywhere from 12 to 15,000 U.S. dollars a month at the 100 gig level. I think a logical crossover is by two or three 100 gigs, at some point it make, makes good sense to go on the dark fiber end and um, go your route with uh, the dark fiber IRU. So I think uh, fantastic business model. Sure. Thanks. I think that's exactly it. It's the ability to have a very low threshold where it makes sense to, to get dark fiber, which can meet all your future requirements without that incremental OPEX, uh, simply because it's a very low threshold where, uh, like you said, uh, two to three hundred uh, G circuits where you really hit that point where it makes economic sense to, uh, to, to purchase a dark fiber versus lease slick capacity. Purchase a dark fiber and push 25 terabits without uh, any amplification. Pretty nice model. Very clean. And Gil, thank you, Mike. And Gil, how do you see the bandwidth demand? Uh, how do you see that playing in dark fiber, clearly dark fiber, and your history playing into NJFX? Sure. So I, I agree with Mike in terms of on the terrestrial side, dark fiber rules, right? Because it allows you certainty in terms of how your route is being done for you. When you buy a lit service, you're kind of susceptible to regrouping of the network. So you buy it from a carrier or a lit transport service, you're promised diversity day one. They have a situation that happens six months later, they've got to go back now and regroom that network. Your diversity might be lost. So the ultimate solution of diversity is to have your own dark fiber, manage it, and know how it works. Now, obviously, as you get to a location like NJFX and you're crossing the Atlantic Ocean, you can't always have a pair of fibers across the ocean. But the good news is that those pairs of fibers today that are landing at NJFX, and as you know, we have spare bores that you could use for more cables to come here. They're 21 terabit plus systems. So getting dark fiber to NJFX allows you now to by CBROS capacity, TGN1 capacity, TGN2 capacity, Aquacom's capacity. You're getting lots of optionality, so it's really a home for dark fiber to come from multiple different ways, get the diversity you need, manage and control your network. How many dark fiber providers do you have coming into the building today? Sure, so between here and Ashburn, we have seven dark fiber routes between four carriers to get you down to Ashburn. Of those carriers, three of them will sell you dark fiber. Altis is the only one not, I'll take that as five. Altis and Windstream will not sell you dark fiber. That's not really their model. But Sinesis will, Zayo will, Level 3 will sell you dark fiber. Heading north, Cross River is soon to be coming into the building in September. They're going to have the lowest latency, newest route connecting NJFX to this cable, this cable landing station NJFX up north to the exchanges. They're going to be someone that's going to be in demand. And then Zayo sits on the Parkway Turnpike, so they're going to be up and down the Parkway Turnpike, whether it's Philly, Ashford, heading up north. And then Light Tower is here. They're always willing to sell dark fiber. As a matter of fact, I put them in the category of also leasing dark fiber going down towards Ashburn. The last location that people are now looking at is Virginia Beach. We're getting multiple requests to connect from here to Virginia Beach through Ashburn and bypassing Ashburn. So that's going to be an interesting project because with those two new cables, they're natural partners for NJFX. Virginia Beach, NJFX, and then the landings over in Long Island. They're all part of the triangle of how you cross the Atlantic Ocean. You got plenty of new people, like you said, like Cross River, Mike and Enzo coming into the building with new fiber, new glass in the beach route. So uh, yeah, you're in high demand. And uh, again, 
well far away from Manhattan and the bullet zone, right? And the, and the right. bullseye. So, good. Thanks, Gil. And Ken, uh, how, gosh, how does uh, dark fiber play into your business model? And, uh, you know, what verticals are you seeing uh, come your way and ask you for, you know, LOIs on your new system? Oh, so I guess there's uh, two different aspects to that. Uh, first, there's a, the uh, relationship between <clears throat> Vancouver and Seattle. And uh, that business relationship is uh, <clears throat> in the tech sector is expanding uh, year over year. Uh, we've seen a 50% increase uh, in uh, bandwidth demand uh, uh, year over year for the last four years. And there is no dark fiber left on that route. There's not. Our fiber will be six times greater in capacity than the current one that is um, is today. Uh, from a, from an international uh, trans-Pacific perspective, uh, there's a lot of Asian money in Vancouver, and it's in, it's increasing every day. And we're getting now uh, requests uh, for people in uh, or companies in Asia. To, uh, to be able to transit North America without uh, passing through the United States. And uh, the perception, real or otherwise, is that Canada's privacy laws surrounding data sovereignty are more inclined to uh, favor the owner of the data as opposed to a, a government security agency. And whether, whether or not uh, that's Entirely true is another question, but again, you're dealing with uh, perception being reality in this particular instance. Yeah. Well, you have a, a fantastic route again, and I, you know, for someone building new glass along this route, uh, you know, it's not the normal run, and or just taking you to the border to go all the way, the rest of the way uh, to Vancouver. I think, uh, you know, you've got a winner there as well. And again, new glass, so good for you. Um, I do want to ask. I'm going to uh, skip down to another question that. Uh, uh, that I want to kind of hit today while we're here is what other subsea cable development challenges are you seeing in the marketplace, you know, today? Uh, and and have, have, we, have we stalled out? Have we, you know, I think we're seeing new players enter the space, the Alibaba's, Tencent's, Apple's, different players that are coming in. You know, it's not just the OTTs. Or, I mean, have they, have they stalled out? Are they still a big part of the game? Are they driving the demand? And, uh, you know, how does that play into what you're seeing and the challenges you're facing? And Mike, I think we'll go back to you. Yeah, I, I mean, the OTTs are definitely the driver for your big projects, especially your transoceanic projects. And I think that'll be the case for, for the foreseeable future, where in most instances, you need at least one of them as an anchor tenant, at least one um, really to make a, a project economic. Uh, for for smaller projects like, like Cross Lake and a couple of other ones that we're looking at the feasibility of, they're more niche players and they fit more into the carrier market. They're also non-repeated projects. So really our uh, our service offering is, is dark fiber because we have a high fiber count cable. Uh, that's the model that we're looking at. And in those instances, we don't need uh, any sort of, um, of, of OTT as, as a driver. I mean, the great thing if you're along uh, a long repeater system that goes across the ocean. The great thing about an OTT is they don't compete with you. They're buying that capacity and using it internally. Uh, so you're not adding new competition into the market, whereby on our routes, we're selling dark fiber to anybody. We're not competing with our customers by selling lit capacity. And so I think that model really enables us to, enables us from a, a project development perspective, not to require certain uh, customer segments to have to sign on in order for us to get those pre-sales and move a project forward. Yeah, I wouldn't know uh, one Canadian carrier that wouldn't be buying on that route, I would say, let alone a U.S. carrier just trying to get the north to 151 front, you know, the mecca of uh, of Canada there. Just not, uh, as you can tell, just not a Leafs fan behind me. Uh, anyway, I will uh, it will go to Gil as well. What what kind of subsea cable development challenges are you seeing for NJFX or just in the marketplace as alone? Sure. So think about a subsea project. It's really a development play, and they're, they've got various levels of risk. They've got to get their customers. They've got to get their funding, and they got to go to manufacturing and manufacture the cable. They have to coordinate where they're going to land the cable on two sides. We mitigate part of that risk since. When Tyco built this facility back in 1999, they put in spare bores to the ocean that come all the way to our building that have been proven out recently with the CBROS cable. So 
we're actually helping mitigate risk for CE cross Atlantic projects now because the boards are there, they're all available, they're coming into a secure site that's a neutral site, they can feel comfortable that their landlord won't compete with their interests. So we're actually helping mitigate those risks. We're helping them postpone having to make hard decisions because if you're going to land a cable in the U.S., you probably need a good year to two to three years of planning where in our case, 30 days out, let us know you're going to come in on the board and we're going to have you up and running. Yeah, we were definitely built for the future, for sure. And Ken, uh, well, you know, what challenges are you seeing with the subsea cable development uh, uh, marketplace? Uh, for us, it's regional. Uh, there, um, this is a very unique, um, a unique region on the Pacific Coast. Uh, the tidal currents, uh, that sort of thing, uh, play uh, a large uh, to to a large extent where the where you can actually place fiber. Uh, us heading north uh, into Prince Rupert uh, represents some fairly significant challenges. Uh, the good news is is that uh, we are uh, we will have um, our own dynamic positioning cable laying barge at our disposal here, um, and we know uh, uh, we know the folks that built uh, that built all the uh, subsea cables for the hydro company here. So the for us it's. Uh, Justifying the business opportunity against the cost of that build, uh, not the actual build itself. And that's where the provincial government will come into play here. Uh, because without their support, it's really hard to justify that build going north uh, through the various small communities that don't have a hope in, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, paying for that kind of build from a, from a dollars and cents perspective. Typically, obviously, with the port to take on uh, anything coming in, that whether multiple cable landing stations right there at the port of Vancouver, but also multiple ports along the way, and, uh, and then you're tapping into your new fiber build, which absolutely. The, uh, that brings me to my next question. You know, as these projects develop, you know, what is the current landscape for financial investments? Are you seeing a lot of interest from private equity companies? like terrestrial cable networks, and how has that impacted your business models? Mike, I'll throw that to you. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely changed very materially over the last number of years. I mean, in the decade after the dot-com boom, uh, there was really no new cables or no new large cables being built, uh, and definitely not with private capital as opposed to off a carrier's balance sheet. And so over the last you know few years, you've seen a number of big cables uh, come to fruition that were privately financed. Uh, Arctic Quintillion, uh, Aquacom, Seaborn, Hawaii, and even, even Hibernia uh, Express. I mean, Hibernia Express was an operating company, but that represented a very material uh, build for the company. And now that they've actually exited, I think it has further greased the wheels for the, uh, the financial community, whereby a lot of your typical investors are seeing multiple deals, there's very much a herd mentality, and people have gone through the learning curve or due diligence on different projects, so they're a lot more familiar with them, and it's not as a, a foreign or scary kind of concept. And so I think for those reasons, combined with the current multiples that you're seeing, a lot of the M&A happen today. I think it's uh, it's never been a better time uh, since the dot-com boom to, to finance a new project. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You're right. With that one exit, that was uh, you are seeing multi major multiples now nearing 10, uh, 10 times EBITDA. Yep. Yeah. Great. It was eight and a half times, but now I think you're seeing it closer to 10. It's great for our our community. And Gil, how do you feel about the current landscape for financial investments? Sure. So think of it this way, right? Most of these projects have a couple of layers of financing. The first layer is going to be the equity side, and that's someone willing to put some skin in the game and an investment in an idea. And they're going to go out, they're going to go chase customers. But the hurdle rates for financing on the debt side have gotten lower. Our low interest rates over the last seven to eight years now have really fueled those hurdle rates to be less. So when a developer goes to try and start a project and he's chasing that customer to be an anchor customer, it's, it's not as large a financial obligation on that side because the debt is cheaper. So 
any investor in the network knows they can get debt financing, like in the case of CBRAS, they were able to get the French government to basically help fund that project on the debt side through Alcatel. Those rates were less, therefore the hurdle rates become smaller and projects happen sooner. I think for that reason, you'll continue to see more projects happen in this current interest rate environment because the hurdle rates are smaller. That's right. And uh, the government playing into it, I, I think that plays right into Ken as well. I'm sure the government's uh, very interested in uh, helping uh, your project out, Ken. Yeah, they're, um, they've got a new fund now. They're prepared to invest over $700 million in infrastructure, and that, include, that includes uh, telecom. So we're, uh, we're hoping to, to take advantage of that. Um, certainly that will help us justify uh, the, uh, the subsea build north. Uh, and I concur with, uh, with both Mike and Gil. I, we're experiencing now uh, equity companies uh, coming to us with packages. So they'll, they'll put in the equity, but they'll also arrange for the debt. And uh, we're now dealing with four of those. So it's, uh, it's been interesting from that perspective. I thought that that would be a lot more difficult than it would appear to be now. That's great. Money readily available, which we'd like to hear. So thank you for that. Uh, that brings me on to my next question. You know, where do you see the subsea cable industry headed in the next three years? And what new opportunities are on the horizon, do you, do you believe? And I'll start with Mike. Um, I think you're going to see a couple new transoceanic projects, both on the Atlantic and the Pacific side. I think you'll probably see uh, a few on the Atlantic side that that uh, are, are still yet to be announced and built. And similarly, on the Pacific side, I think you'll you'll see the same. Um, Beyond that, I think uh, really there will be a, a movement towards more regional systems, uh, just because I think a lot of the, the the factors that are driving those new transoceanic routes, um, the the different players behind them have, to a large extent, met their requirements, and without those drivers, uh, there's no natural people to really um, uh, facilitate the development of some of those new. Uh, very long transoceanic routes. I think on the, the smaller regional systems and niche systems, I think there's always an opportunity there. Uh, it, it's just being creative and, and finding those those opportunities. You are creative at that. Uh, been successful with Arctic Fiber and a few others. So uh, you know, kudos to you. I think that uh, you know finding those little niche plays uh, from point to point where you know markets are underserved or thin routes. I think you're, you're accomplishing that today. And, as is Ken. Uh, so, so keep those projects up and, and those will happen in the next three years for a lot of folks and there will be more to come with diversity plays and, um, you know, and, and needs for customers that will uh, arise. So thank you, Mike. Gil, where do you see uh, things happening next three years, uh, you know, especially around your site and what are the new opportunities? And I think we talked about the infrastructure coming in, so um, clearly you're set up for the future. Sure. So, so I think the term is called branching units. I think we're going to see many of them that we never thought we'd see before, that we're going to see cable operators reevaluate networks they've had in place for some period of time and say, why can't I branch off and connect to another landing station? We're in a great position to receive branching unit equivalents, I guess, right? Shortcuts, water shortcuts, whether it's us, Virginia Beach, going down to Florida. If you think about it, the amount of capacity in the Atlantic has tripled in the last four years with Brusa, Morea, Monet, Aquacons, lots of new capacity. But now we're going to start optimizing it, right? Why does it have to come only to one spot? Why can't it come to three or four spots along the East Coast? Why can't you start shedding that traffic across and kind of managing it correctly? So I think that's the next step, and I think the U.S. guys will enjoy – getting to multiple landing stations, getting to all of them, and then demonstrating how their network uniquely gets across to other unique locations across the U.S. You know, the U.S. still enjoys most of the content creation, but a lot of the OTTs are trying to potentially look at having other parts of the world create content. Well, they're going to be in a great position. Having all that capacity coming across the Atlantic, whether it's South America, Europe, or around the globe, having all that capacity, traffic go both ways, and now you have diversity with all these new branching units across multiple landing stations, whether it's Canada or it's the East Coast or the West Coast. 
You know, the world is flat, as Milton Reed said, right? And he said, everyone will be equal at one point in terms of how we connect and how we communicate. And, and thanks to the investment that's happening in these subsea networks, that's becoming reality. And you're absolutely right with the BUs. Uh, you know, we were successful with Hibernian putting a BU into Northern Ireland based on a government project, so kind of like Ken's, you know, going to have a branching unit uh, that he could uh, accept traffic, obviously, into Vancouver. You know, we did it into Belfast and uh, the Northern Ireland and 13 other cities, uh, again, for the government. So the government plays a huge role in that. But, again, these cable systems that have been in the water 10 or 12 years still can put in a branching unit. And Ken, I think that BU plays right into your story, too, where you could have, you know, a cable hit the west coast of, I don't know, Oregon or hit the Bay Area, but also branch up to Vancouver and into your project. Is that where you see things in the next three years? Yeah, absolutely. I think the the diversity play for us is huge. Uh, we've been talking, the subsea operator that we've been talking to about landing here uh, is considering putting a branching unit just off the coast. And uh, we would actually pick it up from there with our barge and uh, bring it to Vancouver and then also from the branching unit into Seattle. And then what that would do is we would be able to use our terrestrial fiber for route diversity. And uh, that's, uh, that's a very attractive value add for us. And so I just, I just see that, uh, like Gil said, the, the branching units, the diversity uh, plays uh, plays heavily with what uh, with our business success, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Create a little bit of diversity there, and you have a nice landing in Vancouver, and then, uh, yeah, you, you just create a nice little triangle of diversity for uh, clients that want to come into both areas. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, my last question of the day, I, I think I just want to know, um, what's your one word of advice uh, for those that are looking to enter the subsea marketplace as either an investor or builder, and we know there's a lot of folks out there with a lot of projects on their mind, but, you know, what is your one word of advice, having been successful in all these areas? And I'll start with Mike. Um, I mean, to, to sum it up on one word might be uh, difficult, but I'll say prudence. I mean, you have to you have to be prudent in terms of uh, really understanding your, your product and market fit, uh, as well as um, the, the technical challenges that come with certain routes and you know your third pillar of kind of I think a uh, developing a, a project is on the financing side uh, you always have to ensure that the the nature of how you go and develop a project lends itself to being able to uh, to achieve that that funding I agree with that 100 percent Gil I hadn't thought about that question, but what comes to mind is ecosystem. So traditionally, a lot of these cables had one purpose in mind, but we're realizing now that they affect many different industries, many different applications, and the savvier that developer becomes in terms of knowing how they can work with others and develop positive relationships, whether it's other subsea providers, whether it's uh, cable landing stations, whether it's U.S. terrestrial folks, OTTs, knowing how you fit and being a good player. So join the ecosystem, you know, be honest, be forthright, cooperate with others, play nicely, and you'll be part of a pretty exciting industry. Absolutely. And Ken, what, uh, what would you see as your, maybe your one word of advice or a sentence of advice uh, for the sub-C as an investor or a builder, being both? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's experience. Uh, I think uh, all three aspects, whether it's uh, sales, marketing, uh, engineering, uh, and financing, uh, it, it can't be the first rodeo for anybody. Uh, I think you need uh, you need experienced partners and uh, experienced staff. We're lucky in that we've been involved in infrastructure in one form or another over the last 20 years. So for us, the engineering aspect and the marketing part of that is is um, it's not easy, but you know certainly we've had experience. We understand the oops factor where something's going to go wrong at some point, and it's how do you deal with that. And then the the third part is finding a financial partner who's in the space already, so that you're not trying to re-educate a bank or somebody that uh, isn't in this tech sector, for lack of a better word. Absolutely, and I. I think you nailed it on the head with uh, experience, and I uh, think everyone on this panel uh, is, we have, gosh, probably, 
say nearly 100 years of experience on this panel, uh, not to quote anybody's age here, but yeah, I would uh, I would agree with that. Experience in this marketplace and who you know and what you know and, and the projects and being able to find the them with the right people are just about everything. But um, I want to wrap it up on my end, and I want to thank every one of you, Mike Cunningham, Gil Santelis, and Ken Thorpe, for uh, being part of uh, my panel today on the State of the Subsea. And, uh, of course, thank you, Jamie Scotto, always, uh, JSNA. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, Eric Gutschel, the founder of United Cable Company, you can see unbelievable job all around, uh, unbelievable insight. Um, and thank you again, esteemed panelists, our experts. Um, for sure, uh, you know, the subsea uh, industry couldn't uh, be what it is today without, without the four of you. So thank you. We hope to see you gentlemen and everyone here uh, watching live and on demand at Telecom Exchange LA, November 6th to the 7th. And to get your C-Level featured in our CEO roundtables at Telecom Exchange or right here virtually, go ahead and email us at pr at jamiescotto.com. Thanks for tuning in to JSA TV and JSA Radio. And until next time, happy networking.